This is Bert. Sit. This is Gus. Oh, you didn't, you little bastard. You stole it from me. Sit. Sit. I shouldn't say bastard. Um, this is their roadmap to success. Uh, now, Bert here is a six-month-old puppy, and he doesn't look like a six-month-old puppy. He's almost full-grown. He's going to be a big boy when he's older. Um, and most of the session we worked with him. Gus is the older dog. Come. Um, and he's about two, and he's better behaved, a lot more relaxed. He's pushing the boundaries, and I think that he doesn't realize how big he is yet. So in this uh, session, we went over a lot of different things to help the dogs uh, start to develop more respect for the humans as authority figures. The video above this is the video that I'd like to see the guardians using for both dogs to teach them to stop jumping up when they're excited. Now, the best time to do that, as I mentioned in the video, is right when we come home. So when we're on our way home, call or text your partner and let them know, hey, I'm going to be home. You, uh, let's do door exercise. And if she's available, great. And if not, then you do it another time. But the idea for that is really try to do it as many times as you can when, people, uh, when you first come over. And you can also do that with your friends if your friends are comfortable with it. Now, only do it with one dog at a time. We did it with uh, Gus here was in a bedroom. That's ideal. So we want to have the other dog kennel or somewhere. We can help the dog focus one at a time. We have two dogs. A lot of times we try to do things with both dogs simultaneously. It is always harder and longer because you just can't give the dog your full attention. So whenever you're teaching your dog things, separate them, work with one dog at a time, it's much easier. Gus already has an advantage because he was here first. Uh, and so, here you go, Gus. Uh, so, so Gus uh, had some time before uh, Bert was here. And so Gus got some one-on-one -on -one time. So don't ever feel bad or guilty. I'm only giving it to one dog, not giving it to the other. Um, now, sometimes I'll do, I'll, I'll use uh, motivation for, uh, for, come here, buddy. Uh, obedience to, or a treat to motivate them. So like right here, I have them at the same place. Sit. Sit. Whoever gets, whoever does what I want first gets the treat. Whoever doesn't do it or does it second doesn't get anything. If they sit at the same time, I would give them both a treat. But because he didn't perform the way I wanted, that gives him more of an incentive to want to do it in the future because well, if I'm first, I get a big payment. I get something you don't get. Well, then he's going to continue to do that more and more often. Okay, um, uh, so in the video above, we, we talked about uh, tips for jumping. Uh, another thing that I like to do, and I would really practice that, but once we get that going, my next thing is I, when I'm coming home, if the dogs are loose, have the guardian come to the door, and I know that you guys use your back door, but I probably use your, you do it in both locations, just your front door is a little bit more open. You can do the back door as well, though. Um, so basically, come home, open the front door, uh, inside door or outside door, open the inside door so it's open and they can see through the glass door here or here. And then basically step right outside. And they're all excited, wait for them to settle down. It's the same principle in the video above this. The only difference is instead of stepping on the leash, we're remo moving ourselves. So as soon as they start to settle down, start to reach for, uh, 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 start to reach for the handle. Off. Uh, and just this reach will probably cause the dogs to get excited and then do a pull back. And the idea is you just basically, you're, I'm only going to come in when you're completely calm, but before I even get to that point, I'm going to break down, answer the door, individual steps. First one's just reaching for it. You might not even make it all the way to the handle. As soon as they get excited, pull back. Wait for them to settle down. When they settle, reach again. So each time you get a little bit closer, a little bit closer, when you can actually touch the handle, then just practice touching it, pull your hand back, touching it, pull your hand back. Once they stay calm for that, then jiggle it a little bit. And we want to go through, when I fix dog problems, what I try to do is break things down into individual steps and help the dog practice one step at a time over and over until it knows how to do that one step. Only then do I go to the next step. When the dog is calm, understands what to do, is under control. And so by breaking down individual steps, we can help the dog practice and develop confidence in what we want them to do. Once they know all the individual steps, then we can string them all together in the easiest capacity possible. We have a party and people coming in the door, that's a horrible time to practice. Practicing with, with, with our, our guardians, and it's just us, and we have plenty of time to do it, that's the best time to practice. So, um, and, and again, as soon as they get a, show any excitement, we step right back outside. Eventually, you get to the point where you come to the door, and they're just like, oh, it's another drill, man. And they get bored about it. It's boring for them, not bored. And they just start to relax. And then you come in, and they, they learn to regulate that initial bout of energy. You can pan over here, and can you see them? So one of the rules that we went over is not being allowed in the furniture, and that was, of course, well, they both did it, so you can come back to me. But uh, I simulated a dog bed down there. And so uh, we taught, called that, uh, what do we call that? Uh, padre. Padre. 
And so um, remember how to do that, tossing the treats at first, say the word. And remember, anytime you're using a treat, the dog should hear the command word after the treat goes in the mouth. He's not supposed to be on the couch, but that's okay because we're in the middle of filming this. Um, uh, let me see. So we'll, we might as well talk, talk about rules. For dogs, um, if they don't have any rules, they can see themselves as your peer. Dogs are all about what they see us do. Well, if they don't see us acting like a leader by enforcing rules or acting like a leader in other capacities, they don't see any reason to respect us and listen to us. So uh, my philosophy is I don't practice dominance theory. I don't want the dog to be punished. I don't want him to be submissive. I want a dog to be a member of the group, but just understand it doesn't have as much status or ranking as I have. So what I do is I basically, um, uh, one of the ways I do achieve uh, what I call a healthy leader follower dynamic is by enforcing rules consistently. Now, I went over the importance of rules, and rules should be in place for 30 days minimum or as long as the problem's still going on. For dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have. And so letting a dog sit at the same height as you is one of the ways we say we're peers. So for 30 days or as long as the problem's still going on, I recommended we say no furniture. Now, at the end of the 30 days or whatever the period is, if I want to invite the dog up and I make the invitation, this is a privilege that I extend to the dog, and it's for good behavior. So I invite the dog up and it starts barking, it has to get down. Or if it starts, it gets up and it starts shoving with his leg, which is what Bird likes to do, then he has to get down. Uh, that way, it, you know, again, it's a privilege for good behavior. It's the human's resource that we're sharing with the dog, not the dog taking a resource they think is all partially theirs. Another rule would be not to be allowed within seven feet of the humans who are eating food. So if we're eating food on the, on the couch, we have two couches here. I'd imagine there's kind of like a square here in front. And the dogs are not allowed to go in that area when we're eating food on this or that couch. Same thing in there. If the dining room is going to be in there, you might want to even make this line between the two rooms. They're not allowed to go in the dining room when there's food present. The rest of the time you can kind of go. But when there's food present, not allowed. Another rule is not being allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. The rest of the time they can go in and out. Now for dinner and for the kitchen, we can practice, help the dog practice the behavior. So get a piece of roast beef, a piece of bacon, a piece of Canadian bacon, microwave it so it smells like a real meal. Then we sit down at the table and pretend like we're actually eating dinner. Now, when we're actually eating, we're hungry, we're thinking about eating food. The dog tries to come in, it, it's, it's frustrating, we're not paying full attention to him, and then we gotta stop what we're doing, creates more frustration. Well, if we just put a piece of bacon there and pretend like we're cooking, or pretend like we're eating, then when the dog breaks the boundary, we stop and we go rush towards them, use the same principle technique that I showed you, we just got done feeding the dogs and just to keep them out. Now, we have a kind of a bigger entry between the uh, living room and the dining room. If that's too big to defend, you might get a piece of wood or something that we can kind of slide over and make it a little bit of choke point, put some of the chairs up, create a, like a, a blocking, a, you know, a, a, a tighter zone that's easier for you to defend. Then after you practice a little bit more, you can move them gradually out and out and out. After several meals, there are no, nothing, nothing uh, to make it a shorter entry or a narrower entryway, but the dog's still respecting it on their own. Now, I went over how to teach dogs to get off of furniture and directional commands. Remember, go to each, uh, each uh, portal or doorway and toss the treat out one dog at a time. So one dog's in the kennel, the other dog's going around the house doing this. We toss it out, and the dog goes and get, looks it up. We say the word out, when it comes back, we repeat that process. Do the same thing for getting off the furniture. Um, just toss a treat on the floor and say the word off when he licks it up. Remember, anytime the dog gets a treat, the command word sh uh, should follow after the treat goes in the dog's mouth, not the same time, not before. Um, let me see. Um, also look for ways to delay gratification. We just went through feeding them. Feeding is an important activity for dogs. He likes to wolf down his food and then he likes to go and hang out next to him and try to take his food. Now, anything our dog is doing when we pet it is what, we're what we are reinforcing. So if our dog is fearful when we pet it, we're making it slightly more fearful. But the other side of that coin is anything the dogs are doing in our presence that we don't specifically disagree with, as far as the dogs are concerned, we're giving two thumbs up. So if the humans watch Bert go and steal Gus's food and nudge Gus away and then take his food, Bert thinks that we're okay with it and so does Gus. And then that causes the dog to think that we need to, uh, they need to look out for things themselves. And sometimes that creates an issue. I've already noticed Bert moving away from Gus, uh, or excuse me, the other way around, Gus moving away from Bert um, for attention or for a water bowl or different things like that. So keep your eye on that. If you notice that when, when Bert comes around, uh, uh, Gus is going to move it away. Maybe we, you know, uh, you know, ask Bert to stay off the side and call Gus back and try to recreate that situation where Gus doesn't feel like he needs to move away. We want the dogs to be able to feel that they're comfortable in the human's uh, leadership and that they have about the same role. Now, he might be a little bit higher rank than him. I think it's more just he's really more boisterous, has more energy, and is bigger right now because he's actually an older dog. But just like us, some people are natural leaders, some people are natural followers. 
So they work out the dynamic a little bit amongst themselves, but making sure that we're feeding him first gives him a little bit of status over him. Also helps the dogs develop more self-control. Just make sure whoever's feeding them first takes the first bite of food, takes uh, five or more bites of something first. Then we give him permission to eat. When he gets done, he has to leave the area, then he comes in. Message me if you have questions about feeding. Um, we also went over uh, uh, ways to reinforce positive, reinfor uh, positive behaviors. Um, one of them is uh, what I call pet petting with a purpose. So he just climbs on top of his humans. He just shows no respect for personal space. Before we get to petting with a purpose, use those escalating consequences I went over to disagree with unwanted action behavior. Is it, is it, do I need to, let's make it a little bit easier? Yeah, you can blind that. There we go. Is it, is it now, is it backlit? Or is it too dark? No, it's good. Okay. Um, so basically, um, you, the four escalating consequences, hiss, stand up, turn, remember your authority is whatever direction your hips are pointed at, um, pivot until the dog's stationary, take two steps backwards, pause one second, go back to doing what you're doing, second consequence. Third one is march deliberately at the dog, don't slow down, don't do it casually, the dog needs to think, I'm going to get run over if I'm still here. Keep marching at the dog until it turns sideways to you or greater, then stop, then go to the second consequence, follow those steps. Uh, unless the dog's in the designated no dog zone. We are feeding them, the dog can help them try to go into the kitchen. While you're not allowed to cross this particular line, as soon as you cross that line, I'm rushing right at you. And even if you turn sideways, I'm gonna continue rushing at you until you get across the line. But normally for the third consequence, we march directly at the dog until it turns sideways or greater, and then we stop at that point. The fourth uh, consequence is the leash timeout. If you forget how to do all these, just give me, uh, send me a message, I'm happy to share a video or explain it to you on the phone. Uh, let me see, we also went over petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is if he comes up and nudges me, or actually he's more of the nudger, right? Uh, so if Gus comes up and nudges me or whatever it is, and I pet him, I'm telling Gus, yes, you're in charge of me. When you tell me what to do, I do it. So now when Gus nudges me, I'm gonna give him a counter order, tell him to sit. When he sits, pet him under his chin and say just the word sit. Not good sit, not what, a, oh, what a smart dog you are, just the word sit. Um, I use the word uh, paycheck if I suspect somebody is petting the dog without a purpose. Because even if I just want to pet uh, Bert, I'm still going to ask him to sit. And then I pet him afterwards and I say sit and pet him under his chin. Never pat a dog on top of the head. Um, after a while, the dogs will start coming up and sitting in front of you to prepay for attention. When they do, make sure you do recognize or reward that. Um, let me see. So say, um, uh, and that leads me to passive training, which is basically rewarding the dog every time they do a desired action or behavior when we don't ask for it. They just happen to organically offer it. Every time your dog comes to you, you should pet it and say, come. Every time it sits down next to you, pet it and say, sit. Uh, he had problems laying down, so uh, the guardians, I like to use fun command words because dogs can read a human facial expression, so they said, well, let's call it uh, crash. Uh, or no, chill, excuse me, so chill and lay down. So they say chill, and the dogs lay down, your friends laugh, the dog sees that, and the dogs are all happy about it, or the, you know, that they made the humans happy. Now, of course, they're both breaking the rules, not being allowed on the couch, but that's okay, because we just started enforcing these. Um, let me see, we went over uh, how to give a how to uh, train a dog to go to a dog vet in command. I would probably put it in this position. You'll have to do something about your screen so they can't go back there. Get, uh, get it on Groupon. I like the Sealy Posturepedic or the Memory Foam versions of the bed. You're probably gonna get a large or an extra large, so they can both sleep on it together. And just toss the treats the same way that I showed you. <laughs> So, if again, that's a privilege. So once they are allowed on the couch, if they start doing that, then they have to get down. Uh, there it goes. Off. Very good off. That was very good. I'm using way too many words right now. I should have just said off and let it be there, but I'm filming the video. Uh, so just say just the command word. And something else the guardians should probably do is make a list of the command words because like a lot of my clients, they have a number of versions of the same command. Come, come here, over here, here boy, dog's name, whistle, tap my thigh, something else. We have, usually do about seven to 10 commands, command words for every command action. That makes them have to memorize a huge list of words where it's much easier for us to consolidate and exclusively say sit, chill, crash, or whatever. Uh, let me see, what else am I forgetting? Uh, we went over a leave it exercise. If you have questions or forget how to do the details of that, message me, I can have videos, I can show you where we go through that. Um, hopefully we're gonna have uh, Bert in our 301 puppy class. He's six months old and uh, he's a very strong dog and the guardian can't actually walk him uh, because he's so strong. 
Now, I don't like ever using a pinch or a prong collar or any pain causing device. I want to teach the dog to walk with a loose leash, and that's what we do in our 301 class. So um, that should really help. Lydia is our instructor, and she's going to take good care of it. Uh, but remember, uh, I, well, uh, I usually say recognize or testify if the dog does something that I want that we can use passive training for. So every time the dog comes to me, if I didn't see it, one of the guardians could say, ah, oh, recognize. I turn and I just go, oh, come, or whatever the word is of what the dog is doing. Don't ask, just start petting automatically. Uh, come here, buddy. This is how I get a dog to come. You're not doing it very well. Come on, buddy. There you go. The lower you go, typically, the more it's for the dog. Um, so st I start off like this, and then I start lowering my hand. See how that brought them both to it. And then I would let them, usually I make them sit like this. Uh, Bert, Bert. I know that tail's tempting. Bert, come here, buddy. I go on an arc over their head. Bert, come on, buddy. All right, I have to actually have a treat. Uh, that's, a good, uh, that's a good little lesson. Don't do this a lot without actually having a treat. Otherwise, the dogs will learn, oh, they're just trying to fool me. So this is the hand motion I'll show you, and I'll do it with both dogs. So I got an arc over their head. As soon as they sit, I lower it and let them lick it off my hand. And I tickle them under the chin, and I say whatever the command word is. I'll give you one, too. This is a snickerdoodle, but it's a dog version of it. So again, arc over the head. As soon as they sit, I lower it, let them lick it off. I say sit, and tickle them under their chin. Uh, it's a great way to get the dogs to come uh, if you get in a habit of doing that. But don't trick them too often, because after a while, they won't come. Um, let me see. Um, Exercise is a big one. This is what I call a professional level dog, uh, dog breed. He's a German short air pointer. They need more exercise than any three other breeds combined. And so uh, because uh, they're getting exercise at the end of the day, um, it's not as efficient for them. Now they're, the guardians are great. They don't put them in the kennel for too long uh, because they're, they split shifts so it actually works out really well. But basically uh, you don't want a dog to be in a kennel for longer than four hours. It creates, uh, increases cortisol and stress levels of the dogs. Um, so uh, one of the things I recommended was some dog skiing, which is my favorite way to just uh, to burn off excess energy, which is basically putting a dog in a harness, put on rollerblades, and have it pull you. Now the first time you do it, do it when he's got full of full of beans, make sure it's at least an hour and a half after eating, and I would just get do it on a Saturday, put the rollerblades on, and let him pull you as far as he wants to go, and wait for him to stop. Um, now message me if, if you want to do this and I'll tell you what type of harness to get for them. Like, I think it's tough love or rough love, but they have a special one and I can send you the link. Um, but you want to distribute the weight properly. Never do it with a collar because you could collapse their trachea. Uh, but the idea is we figure out how long he needs to go. Dog skiing is really fast. You can, you can go a long distance in a short period of time. Gus stood up and it worked. So remember, use, take, uh, make sure you stand up. Gus, come here, buddy. Yes, I know. It's so hard. There's things outside the house. This is part of why they react this way, because they think that their job is to be in charge of security. So um, one of the things I recommend the guardians do is start an exercise journal and uh, document all of the exercises. Write down the date at the top, and then write each dog's name and create a column for each dog. And then basically write down 918 uh, lasered up and down the stairs eight times. For the laser count, each one down is a one. Um, uh, you can also get a dog backpack if you are going for walks. That makes the walk more efficient. But the rollerblade is just my favorite way to do it. It's quick, it's easy, it's fun, and it works better than anything else. Now, we can also, if we're going to take them for a walk, we can laser them or play fetch or whatever it is in the house a little bit, take off that top level of energy, then take them out for a walk or whatever it is. So setting them up for success can really benefit. Uh, but start the journal, write down the time, write down how much each dog did each activity, and then write down what time to feed them, how much they, how much they ate, um, if there's any, a lot of barking incidents or whatever it is, uh, if there's a fight or dust up, they haven't any fights, but there's a problems. After a while, what you'll notice is, you'll, after keeping this for a couple weeks, you'll notice, start noticing a trend. Every time it's longer than two hours since we've exercised uh, Bert here, he gets in trouble. He starts barking or he gets jumped, goes up, jumps up or whatever it is. So we can actually start being uh, prophylactic and, and getting them the exercise ahead of time. At the end of each day, grade each dog. Give it an A through an F grade. And keep on varying the elements of exercise each day until you get an A uh, at the end of each day for both dogs' overall behavior. Now you know the formula for success, the exercise amount the dogs need in order to succeed. 
Now, uh, avoid petting your dog when it's nervous or anxious or uh, excited or fearful, any unbalanced state of mind. If your dog is nervous, you can let your, leave your hand on the dog and let it know I'm here with you without amplifying. But as soon as you start petting, you'll make a dog more excited, more nervous, more scared. And it just marginally so, but we do this over and over and over again, it becomes a huge problem, it becomes debilitating. I've seen this happen a lot. That's why petting with a purpose and passive training are so effective because if you get in the habit of doing it, Every time you pet your dog, it becomes a micro obedience training session and you're rewarding dogs for desired actions as opposed to chasing them when they do the wrong thing, which is validating for dogs and that's a reward. So um, let me see, what else? Um, get in the habit of walking through the dog and not walking around the dog. So the dog uh, learns that I, its job is to get out of the human's way. That's more of a follower's mindset. Um, whenever possible, ask the dog to come to you. If, you, if I say, you know, uh, Bert, come and he doesn't come, or I, get, I go to him and I provide him affection or attention, that puts him in the driver's seat. So whenever possible, you want to go for a walk, the dog has to come to you. you want to, if I'm playing fetch, I make the dog sit or drop the ball before I pick it up and throw it again. We're going to play these games by my rules. I'm not throwing arbitrary things out there, just little things that are, have the dog have develop a little bit of self, uh, uh, a little bit of self control. Um, let me see, am I forgetting anything? I'm probably forgetting a lot. We covered a lot in three hours. Now, if you have questions, call me or text me. Um, I don't care if it's six years after the fact. I give my personal cell phone to all my clients because I want you to call me and text me. If I don't hear from you, I assume everything's going great. Now, uh, right now, uh, Bert is uh, going to go in uh, to get neutered here shortly because he uh, goes to dog daycare. Um, and I write that down in the exercise journal as well. Um, you're not going to be exercising, but you'd be exercising the other dog that day. Um, but basically, uh, when you do the neutering, again, try to find somebody who uses the, the laser. I use Benson Animal Clinic, Dr. Zimmerman, they have the laser, and they're pretty close by for you guys. Um, I'm trying to think, I think that's pretty much it. Um, now, if you guys do have questions, like I said, don't hesitate, uh, I'm here to support you. Come here. Well, I got one. This is Bert, that's Gus, and this is their roadmap to success. All right, come back to me real quick. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it. Isn't that right?